This programme observes one teacher taking a mixed ability Year 9 class through an in-depth study of World War I. Dale Bannum is well known amongst history educationalists and has devised a number of critically acclaimed lessons. He has co-written a textbook for this World War I study. He is a strong advocate of learning through detail and depth. The pupils have already had an introductory lesson to the context of World War I, and now Dale is concentrating on developing their critical skills by examining a historical documentary in great depth. Today we're going to actually start to look at what it was like to be a soldier in the trenches. Because we're going to be watching a film that was actually made in 1916. Okay, It's called The Battle of the Somme, the official pictures of the British Army in France. The depth study lasts for six weeks and we find that that's really necessary because what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to build in some really important transferable skills that we want them to apply, apply later in Year 9 and also at GCSE. I think if you lead them on a whistle-stop tour of the national curriculum, spending one week on each topic and marching them through the history of the 20th century, uh, to be quite frank, that's not going to happen. The key skill that we're going to be developing today is a, is a skill that's going to be really useful throughout the rest of Year 9 and at GCSE, G GCSE as well. It's a skill called inference. Now, this is a higher level historical skill because what you're actually going to be doing is going from watching a film and looking for obvious clues to actually thinking, what's the hidden messages here? What key points is the filmmaker trying to put across? We're going to have a look at sequences from the film and uh, you can try and tease out the key messages from the film based on the obvious clues that you pick up whilst you're watching the film. When I, when I first started to go into depth on some issues, it was worrying because you're always, as a historian, worried about leaving out key areas of content. But I think we soon realised as a department that you can't cover everything. So I think you need to be quite bold and you have to recognise that certain topics, in our case the causes of the First World War, have to be dealt with um, very much with a light brush as an overview. And that, in, that frees you up at certain other stages to spend six weeks on a topic that is really going to generate interest and enthusiasm amongst the pupils. So what I wanted to do is brainstorm on the board uh, the obvious clues, the kind of things that you picked up from watching those five or six very short uh, moments of film, those clips. OK, so if we start off with equipment and supplies. Yes. Um, lots of weapons and supplies are constantly being shifted. Excellent. So the first very obvious clue here is, in terms of supplies, the British Army had lots of them. Yeah. So there's lots. Big. OK, what were big? The weapons were big. Okay. Everything was big. The British had big guns. H how would you describe them? What would you expect this to do when it landed? Make a big boom. <laughs> <Bang. laughs> Make a big bang, but also have a massive effect. Yeah. Have a big impact. Good. Um, also, they seemed to know what they were doing when they were um, getting the guns ready. They were all knew what they were doing. Right, excellent. And with these big and very destructive and powerful guns, the men knew what they were doing. So the men appear to be very well trained in terms of using this equipment. So these men are about to go over the top. You see them preparing for battle. You also see them returning from battle. What are their attitudes like towards war? Well, they, they it doesn't look like they're afraid of going over. They Good. all go over together and they don't, like, hang back. Excellent. They don't want to get shot. Determined. Good is they all just got down and did what they were supposed to, what the tactics were. Every time that you see them on film, they're always smiling. So okay, it kind of good. implies that they're happy and they're willing to do. OK, what I want you to do now, and I want you to try and make the jump to the next level, I want you to try and think in terms of the inferences that we can pull out from these obvious clues. Turn to the person next to you and let, let's talk through and let's, let's really try and get what are the key messages? They were there because of one country. Yeah. This is a very rare film. This is something that they're not used to every day. I mean, the film was made in 1916. It's very different to the kind of films that are made today. So it has a kind of like curiosity value for pupils. And it really does allow this, this key skill of inference to be pulled out. 
What are the key messages? There weren't that many casualties, but the ones that there were were well cared for and they were made sure that they were looked after. They had lots of armour and they had every bit of help that they could get and nothing was left to chance. The tactics were effective and caused maximum casualties to the enemy. Right, so there's an implication here. What's being implied? Because what you're moving from is something that's very obvious to something that is being implied, a hidden message. And the hidden message here is that, number one, the tactics are very successful because the British don't suffer many casualties at all. But what is also being implied very cleverly in this film is that the Germans are going to suffer a lot of casualties from the mines being blown up, also from the very powerful heavy artillery. Uh, what I want to do next lesson is to come back to the film and say, OK, it's giving us all of these messages. It is telling us a lot about the First World War. It's giving us a lot of information. But as historians, we always need to ask the question, can we trust this information? Can we trust everything the film actually tells us about the First World War? To answer this question, Dale takes the pupils deeper and deeper into the language and images of the film. First of all, did anyone pick up on who actually produced this film? The War Office sent out a small group of cameramen to film the Battle of the Somme. Does that make you more likely or less likely to, to trust the film? Probably more likely because it's sort of the War Office and... So you can obviously trust them? Yeah. Um, you know, they're going to know what they're doing, they're going to be reasonably expert. Who disagrees with Chiara? Uh, Kate? I think it'll make it less likely because um, the government are going to want to show you um, the good parts of war and they're going to try um, and encourage more people to go and fight so they're only show you the positive side. Right, that's an excellent point. The government may have an aim here. Before we, we think about what they were actually trying to, to achieve through this, um, who is this aimed at? And how might that affect whether or not we should actually trust the film? I, I think this video has been aimed at young men that could fight in the war. And it's, it sounds like it's a, a recruiting video almost. Perhaps some people are now starting to turn against the war. And this is like a recruiting drive, an outright piece of propaganda. It's a really good point. Really good point. We were very conscious when we were planning this study unit that we could really push pupils hard because in year seven and year eight they've been brought up very much as critical thinkers. We were very, very keen to build in new dimensions to get pupils thinking about um, applying their critical thinking skills at an even deeper level. That's why we brought in the idea of, for example, the loaded language gun. Words can be just as powerful as bullets. And what can happen is that words can be fired into a sentence and they can totally change the context and the meaning of that particular sentence. So I'd like to look at this idea that perhaps in these intertitles, as Daniel has started to pick up, that certain words have been fired into the sentence and that these words have an explosive impact and that perhaps that the people behind this film were actually very clever. They're actually trying to manipulate the way the audience would think through the words that they actually used. So we're going to have a look now at one um, intertitle, um, which I'm going to put up on the OHP. We're going to make this into a competition to see who can keep going the longest in terms of spotting uh, loaded words. Nerve shattered. Right, nerve shattered. Why nerve shattered? Because it seems like the Germans are terrified out of their wits and that the British were so successful at doing that. Right. Uh, nine point two inch nine point two inch howitzers because it shows it shows the British public just how big the guns they're using are. Right, excellent. I think it's very important that pupils can identify and spot propaganda. They can see when someone's being very selective with the truth. So it's very much an understanding of how governments can use the media to put across a particular line and to get pupils to question that and to think for themselves, not to swallow everything that they see and everything that they read. Tearing, is it like tearing? Uh, we've had tearing, I think, so if you can give one your team wins. A mine crater 40 feet deep because it shows just how powerful the weapons are to blast a crater 40 feet deep. Good, it shows the sheer scale of the weapons being used. So, you three spotted the most loaded words, so well done, excellent. 
Having looked at the key messages and examined the source material, the pupils then take a shot-by-shot -shot look at some of the evidence, concentrating on the sequence where soldiers go over the top. So, the last key question I want to ask of this thought source is, uh, you know, can we trust this film? Is, is it actually, could this be fake? Is this authentic? Are all the shots in the film actually um, reliable shots of men actually in a battle situation? Can anyone see any problems with that particular footage? It looks to me as if the mist is almost too soon. It happens suddenly and the men just disappear into it very, very quickly. Right, so there may have been some kind of dramatic effect going on here to make it look as if the men are disappearing into the mist. Could be anybody else in the trench apart from the people that are going over. You'd think there'd be backups. Okay. If, there was, if they were all killed, there'd be backups. For there doesn't seem to be like any communication trench going back. Um, a man's gone over and he's dropped his weapon. And if you were going over the trenches, you wouldn't just drop your weapon when you're going over, you're going over to heavy fire. Okay. You wouldn't just throw your weapon on the ground. Good. To sum up then, we've started to think very, very critically about using this particular film. You know, as an historian, what do we do with this? Do we just simply just, you know, throw it away? Do we, do we use this at all? Is this, is this particular film, is this just completely useless to us as a historian? Uh, I'd like you to think about that very carefully and discuss that in pairs. We can't really just assume that it's all fake. But it, was, it was filmed at the place of the war and that, that the going over the trench was how they would have done it in a real war. Because these people are all getting over, aren't they? Yeah, and then he's And the then one he's just one. popped his head up and, and he's yeah. dead. So a sniper would take down the others first yeah. because they're easier. No, but he just looked like he slipped. He didn't look like he got <laughs> affected by it, as in he did. So he shot, shot by the bullet. And get, go back, he just fall down. The producer of the film has said, well, could you go here and you go there just so that it makes it look realistic for the audience in England? So it's not a fake scene, but it's been made up to how the producers want to film it. The one danger with this approach is that, that almost that they, they become overly critical and that they dismiss everything that they see and they think that every source that you give them can't be used and literally should be chucked away because it's totally unreliable. So I think perhaps the big challenge in terms of teaching this particular unit is to say, okay then, you've got some concerns about it, but you know, we do need to try and piece this back together to see history very much as an elaborate jigsaw puzzle where we need to take little bits from sources and gradually uh, reconstruct the past. As a historian, I think what we've learned today is you do not just believe the first piece of evidence, the first source you come to and think, brilliant, that's what the First World War was like, I'm gonna use this. But similarly, we don't come across a really um, important piece of evidence and then just chuck it in the bin because either we're slightly worried about a few scenes or because we're worried about the style in which it's written. We think critically about it and we have to think very, very carefully about how we use it. So this is this idea of critical thinking. I want you to take on to future lessons when we look at other sources and other types of evidence Films um, are one area of evidence, but what about the cartoons that were produced at the time by soldiers? Soldiers' letters, soldiers' diaries, they can tell us a lot about the First World War. But whilst, when, when you come to these new types of evidence, I want you to think just as critically about them as you have about the film today.